Hello, everyone. I'm Shirit Sudan. I'm a senior manager in the automotive and IoT line of business at ARM. And today with my colleague, Jason Molgard, who is a, a principal storage solution architect, also in the uh, ANI line of business, we'll be talking to you about using ARM technology to enable disaggregation from devices to servers. This is part of the ARM's Dev Summit um, platform that uh, we use to share uh, our ideas or our <clears throat> ideas with the rest of the ecosystem. So we uh, hope that you enjoy this talk and let's get into this. So we have seen a shift in the data center architecture over the last few years. Uh, what has really happened is that a traditional server rack that I'm showing here on the left hand side um, has uh, certain limitations which over the last few years or perhaps a decade or so has been slowly transitioning to the diagram on the right hand side which shows a composable server rack so the difference between these two architectures is in a traditional server rack the configuration of each individual server is fixed so when you deploy a server in your data center in this traditional architecture, you fix the number of CPUs, you fix the amount of DRAM memory, you fix the amount of storage per server, similarly networking and other accelerators. And each of these servers are similar or same, and they're basically deployed as independent units. There are other kinds of servers as well, uh, specifically if you're looking to do ML training or in-memory databases or other use cases like high-performance computing and video streaming. So what really uh, is the ha had been the traditional design is where each of these components at the deployment time of the servers in the data center, the configuration was fixed. But there's a significant um, disadvantage to using uh, this type of an architecture, specifically when operating at large scale. The disadvantage mostly comes from the fact that some of the resources in each of these servers might not be fully utilized. And what I mean by that is, for example, let's say you configure a server with four terabytes of DRAM. Now that four terabytes might not be used during runtime because the application needs might not dictate that much amount of DRAM to be required or used. So effectively, even though you have provisioned for the worst case scenario, this large capacity of DRAM, you typically end up using uh, a fraction of that capacity. And when you operate these servers or these uh, configurations at very large scale, like large hyperscalers do, um, you quickly realize that you are effectively reducing your TCO or not using your uh, compute and memory and storage resources as efficiently as possible. And this has basically led to the innovations which um, made the data center, large data centers transition from this traditional architecture to this new composable architecture, which we are showing on the right hand side here. The advantage of the composable rack architecture or server architecture is that you basically can at runtime using software defined principles uh, virtually collate a server that your that fits your application needs what i mean by that is for example you have different pools of uh, resources here uh, as shown in the diagram so you have cpu pool you have a memory pool you have storage and acceleration pool and all of these are interconnected using a backplane or some sort of uh, interconnect across this, across the rack now during runtime using software defined principles you can allocate an application let's say four cpus 16 gigabytes of DRAM, four terabytes of storage, and one accelerator for the task. And all of this, once the application finishes, can then be repurposed or use, reused for other applications. And the real advantage of this architecture becomes critical when you notice that as you adapt an application to the composable architecture, you basically can optimize or only provision resources that you that the application really needs so the over provisioning that we talked about in the left hand side uh, that effectively goes away and this is a very powerful tool for large data centers to improve the tco or the total cost of ownership of their infrastructure in the cloud 
So in this background, um, we have been noticing over time that you know, the traditional uh, architecture on the left is transitioning to the architecture on the right-hand side. And the first uh, set of resources that got disaggregated, for example, were the storage uh, devices. So technologies like NVMe over fabric were the critical uh, technologies that made it happen. So in this journey, some parts of the composable architecture are available today. And new uh, technologies like CXL are enabling disaggregation of other resources like memory pool and accelerators. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit in detail about um, in this next slide here. So this slide is uh, going to show how enabling technologies are allowing disaggregation and heterogeneity in the data center to be leveraged for improving TCO. So if you start from you know, the left to the right of this diagram, um, one of the first technologies that got, or resources that got disaggregated in the server uh, was the storage uh, disaggregation. And this is what I mentioned uh, as NVMe over fabric technology. From a technology perspective, the evolution and development of this technology is relatively complete and it's ready to be deployed in production servers and it is being deployed already in data centers. Followed by NVMe over Fabric, the next resources that got disaggregated were um, accelerators. So think of large uh, you know, accelerator uh, devices like GPUs, FPGAs, TPUs, and machine learning, uh, inference and training um, accelerators. Um, today, uh, this space is evolving, but depending on the type of the accelerator, uh, either the technology for disaggregation is um, being deployed. So if it's a mature technology like GPUs, for example, uh, they're already being deployed uh, in a disaggregated fashion. Or if there are uh, upcoming new accelerators, the architectures and such for disaggregation of these accelerators are being developed. So the technology development is in execution. And that kind of brings us to today effectively. Um, today, what we are starting to see is with new technologies like CXL, um, large data centers are starting to do architectural exploration for how to disaggregate memory. And by memory, I mean DRAM and other similarly uh, characterized storage class memories with you know, latency and bandwidth characteristics similar to DRAM. So this is in the architecture exploration phase from a technology development perspective. And we expect these technologies to mature in a relatively short period of time so that they will be deployed uh, uh, in the data center in the next few years. And after memory disaggregation, we are starting to see initial concepts of converging the storage and the memory subsystems. Um, and this is where you know, DRAM and SCM like memory technologies are converged uh, with storage technologies like NAND, for example. This technology is somewhat in a concept phase, so it might take a few years before the technology space matures and you know, uh, the, 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 the converged appliances are ready for deployment. So this top row kind of you know, sh um, showed us the trend of disaggregation and where different technologies are in terms of time. Uh, the lower um, um, row here uh, is going to show us how different types of compute elements, so not just CPUs, but other heterogeneous compute uh, elements like uh, video encoders, for example, um, have been uh, deployed in the data center. Now, Technologies like video accelerators for uh, you know, encoding and decoding have been deployed in the data center for a while now already. Uh, similarly, FPGAs are a relatively mature technology deployed in the data center for accelerating specific, specific workloads. And along similar lines, TPUs and GPUs are custom accelerators uh, along with uh, emerging DPUs or smart NICs uh, that are um, somewhat uh, mature technologies that are in deployment in the data center at scale today. And that's what uh, brings us to today again, what we are starting to see as the technology that is now being developed from a heterogeneous compute perspective is computational storage. So this is in general, the idea of moving compute elements closer to where the data lives, right? And this is uh, 
in progress. The technology isn't mature yet, but uh, there have been some initial uh, products from um, a few uh, startups and such where um, this concept is being explored and it is now becoming um, you know, a thrust area for a lot of data centers. After computational storage, we are starting to see a very interesting trend. With CXL technology, we are starting to see memory expansion and memory disaggregation being enabled by CXL Type 3 devices. We are expecting Type 3 devices uh, as contrast to Type 1 and Type 2 devices uh, for CXL um, to be deployed first. Uh, the difference is that CXL Type 3 devices are purely memory expansion devices and they're easy to program and such. So uh, those are the first technologies that will be deployed for heterogeneous compute in our perspective. And Type 2 will eventually be followed by perhaps Type 1 devices. And these are Type 2 and Type one devices are specifically accelerator devices that are coherently connected to the um, uh, server host CPU. So in this big picture, what we have seen here is that the technologies that enable to improve the TCO at the data center level um, are, you know, in different stages of execution. And the next wave of these technologies uh, is expected to focus around CXL as the enabling technology for both disaggregation and heterogeneous compute. Now, with this background, uh, there is a problem that the industry and the ecosystem as a whole needs to solve for CXL devices. And this is specific to CXL devices uh, enabling heterogeneous compute. So while there is momentum to deploy these devices to improve the TCO, um, there, is still un there are still unanswered questions on how exactly to deploy these, what are the programming models, what are the right abstraction levels that can be exposed to the uh, application versus libraries versus the operating system. So all of these things are uh, currently being developed. So in this context, uh, what we are starting to see is that given the fact that for these heterogeneous um, devices, the use cases are so different because you could have an accelerator that is doing video encode and decode, and then you could have an accelerator that is doing a GPU-like function. So the use cases are very varied and very domain-specific. And this leads to effectively um, the need to just get these devices to work but it is difficult to get them to work because of the fragmentation in the use cases. And this is the true uh, you know, kernel of the problem statement here that today it is just difficult to get these device, uh, uh, CXL devices type one and type to just work. And this is where you know, innovations in software and hardware are needed uh, to bring the entire ecosystem and industry to move forward in a standardized way to deploy and consume these devices to improve the TCO. So from this perspective, in this problem statement, uh, uh, with this problem statement, uh, I'm gonna hand off to my colleague, Jason, who's gonna be talking a bit more about what ARM is doing to address this problem space. Jason, over to you. Uh, thank you, Shidij. I appreciate that uh, background and explanation of the problem. So kind of taking a look at the solution, at the highest level, the ARM's vision for a solution is a baseline accelerator IP for all CXL device types. And, and why do we want to do this? Well, we want to simplify the CXL device non-differentiating items for the ecosystem to make it easy for everyone to um, develop their CXL accelerator by solving some of the hard CXL technology problems for the ecosystem. This will enable faster time to market, lower risk of development, and uh, provide a seamless software ecosystem for everyone. The, uh, additionally, the intent is to have standardized compatibility uh, across compliant devices uh, to reduce qualification and just have a known good solution, regardless of the architecture of the host system. And how exactly are we going to do that? Well. As with any technology deployment uh, these days, there's going to be um, both hardware and software. And, and so from the hardware perspective, we're going to have uh, the logic to integrate or interface with the CXL or PCIe um, endpoint, on-chip interconnect, uh, system memory management unit, uh, interrupt controller, CPU, 
essentially an entire CPU subsystem needed to uh, integrate with uh, uh, the CXL accelerator logic. This, is, this uh, logic is gonna be required of every CXL device. And so why not have it be a, a uniform and, uh, and standardized in many respects? And then in addition to that, that uniform hardware CPU subsystem, standardized software to run on top of it uh, to enable the, the, the CPU uh, accelerator and leverage existing standards like system ready that uh, ARM has defined uh, for device management. So that again, we have a uniform um, base of software from on which we can build up um, the remaining uh, aspect of the software stack. So in the next slide, we'll take a closer look at the, the the hardware details of this uh, proposed baseline CXL accelerator IP. So in this diagram, if we look over on the left-hand side, we have a compute server with kind of three main um, blocks. The CPU SOC has two different uh, CXL ports and connected up to those CXL ports, uh, we have um, uh, a couple of different CXL devices. So uh, in the yellow, we're having a, a CXL type three device, um, which as uh, Shidij had mentioned, is essentially a, a memory expansion um, type device or, or could be memory pooling as well. In addition, connected into the green box is a, a, a CXL type one or type two accelerator. And, and as should have said, I, we think that th there's probably some additional challenge in developing these two accelerators, uh, especially as they're a little further out in time. So we've taken the green block and we've kind of expanded it over onto the right hand side to drill down into the next level of detail. And so if we look inside that expanded green box, there's really three sub blocks um, to take a look at. So over on the right hand side in the large gray box is, is labeled device vendor logic. This is the, the, the most important part of the CXL accelerator design. This is the custom, unique, differentiating, original, innovative aspect of a CXL accelerator that, that someone would uh, develop and deploy. Um, this is where all the innovation is gonna happen for sure in that CXL device. So switching sides to the other side of this green box, we have the third party CXL endpoint IP. Of course, every CXL device has to have uh, be a CXL endpoint and have that CXL logic. And then sandwiched right in the middle in the dashed box is the, 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 the baseline CXL IP that we are referencing. So it's going to have an ARM CPU, interconnect with Crosspoint, all of the components needed to interface between the, the, the CXL endpoint on the left and the unique original uh, custom device vendor logic on the right providing the, the custom functionality uh, for that CXL accelerator. And every CXL device is going to need this uh, logic that's in uh, the, the CXL block uh, or in the dash box. And, um, uh, and, and having a uniform implementation of that allows everyone to focus on their device vendor logic portion, which is gonna be unique and not have to uh, worry about is the, the dash box being implemented correctly? Uh, is anything being missed? Is it going to work at the end of the day? So moving on to the next slide, we can see, take a look at kind of the software side of this solution as well, where we again want to unify the lower level software stacks across these CXL devices and reduce fragmentation. And as part of that, we definitely want to build on system ready. So in the next slide, we'll take a look at the, in more detail on the system ready, but for now, um, there are uh, you know, different bands with uh, different profiles um, for uh, all sorts of, of devices from embedded to server class that are available. And, and essentially all of the CXL device types will map into those uh, existing bands. And that provides a, a standard device management software interface to, to have low level firmware and boot these devices and, and bring them up and, and get them running. But in addition to that, we want to have design patterns uh, for the software for these type one and type two devices uh, that will provide guidance on how to develop the software layers above discovery and management so that it interoperates with the host. And we want to, of course, conform to um, emerging uh, standard host accelerator interfaces that are being defined by standards bodies. We certainly don't want to go off and reinvent the wheel um, if there's already solutions out there. And we want to be able to enable the CXL specific functionality that's going to differentiate a CXL accelerator and, and not um, uh, spend a lot of time on the software aspects that are non-differentiating. 
So as we move to the next slide, we can take a look at the system ready bands in a little bit more detail. So there are already four bands that have been defined um, and, and are exist in existence today. These are um, readily available on the ARM website if you want to pull it up and, and learn more about them. But if we, if we kind of uh, take a look at them starting at the bottom, you'll see that they're all built upon uh, a, a common framework of the device management functionality leveraging the industry standards, OOB, Redfish, et cetera, for example. So there's lots of uh, those, those standards of, that are out there and we certainly don't want to reinvent the wheel. Like I said, we want to use those as we build up the additional layers of these CXL devices. So then layering upon that, of course, we've got the ARM IP that we're proposing, and, and we want to use that ARM IP in a, in a configuration that's compliant with the system ready recipe that specifies essentially the, a, a known good way to connect uh, IP together so that it is capable of then uh, booting standard um, firmware and standard operating systems. And so with that, the, those standard operating systems now in place across those devices, that's where the real differentiation starts to happen as you continue moving up these software stacks. Um, and, and, and so if you look across these stacks, you, that's, you'll see that the, there's a lot of commonality in the lower portion and then the differentiation starts happening as you get higher up. And so if we just pick one out arbitrarily, you know, taking a look at System Ready ES, for example, um, where this could be a, a band for um, computational storage drives where you maybe are running filtering or searching on the drive, the, the lower level hardware pieces are largely similar to some of the adjacent uh, bands, um, but, but with, um, because we've built up the system and to make it compliant with this uh, particular band, it enables these, these functions to just work. You don't have to worry about, um, you, you know, is the system going to boot? Is there a problem running this firmware? Is the Linux distribution going to be compatible? By following these bands, it, it, will, it, it will simply uh, work. And that's the expectation for these CXL accelerator devices. So that as the, that firmware is uh, deployed and then the custom uh, CXL uh, accelerator specific functions developed, you can be assured that it, it's going to be compatible and everything is going to work properly. So as we kind of close out our conversation today, what uh, Shedich has described is that CXL accelerators are emerging as a major growth segment. This is going to be a really a key enabler in the data center. And we really uh, uh, see this uh, a tremendous amount of growth, a tremendous amount of development in this area. And in fact, uh, it's created a, a, tr a lot of activity in the, in the space. Um, we, we've had a number of conversations with folks who are actively considering what how they want to engage and, and develop CXL um, accelerators moving forward. But to really make these things take off, we need to have uniform hardware and software across the ecosystem. Because without it, compatibility is going to be a problem, interoperability is going to be a problem, uh, the, the system isn't going to work uh, very effectively, and it'll take a very long time for them to develop. And we think that using uh, the CXL base accelerator IP from ARM and system ready as our baseline, that we can target all types of CXL devices and any CXL device can be built up from these, these uh, IPs and, um, and be very uh, uniform, compliant, um, and standardized regardless of the CXL function that's being developed. But we recognize that there's still a tremendous amount of development required uh, to bring these products to market, to develop and innovate these, the actual CXL accelerator. And so we would welcome the opportunity to speak to you about your CXL device or system challenges. And together, um, maybe we can collaborate or, or, or help innovate some of those solutions to bring these products to fruition and, and have the, the CXL type one and type two accelerators that we're all envisioning. And so with that, on behalf of uh, my colleague, Shirid Sudan, I'm Jason Molgard. Thank you very much for joining us for this presentation. We hope you have a wonderful day.